Hi, I'm Tyra G, your host of Frankly Speaking with Tyra G. Welcome again to our virtual, global gathering of phenomenal women and all of you who love them. Yes, you, mothers, daughters, grand and great grandmothers, fearsome and generous. Yes, humble and honest and looking for possibilities and purpose. You know, here we dig deep and we come up strong. For those of you listening for the first time, each month we explore a new topic inspired by you. Yes, I did say you. We bravely walk into places that tradition has taught us there's some things we just don't talk about but not at this table. And no matter how hard judgment knocks, it will not get in. Beloved, here, we start right where we are. Every week, we experience, educate, encourage, and empower each other. We share some aha moments, some stories that have been left in our pockets for too long, but every week, we start right where we are. You know, this is a big thank you note from Tyra G. We made it. September is our one-year birthday. I am so excited. You know, I could not have done this without you. Your encouragement, your ideas. You're saying, no, Ty, you got to keep going. When I was saying, oh, I don't know if I can do this. She said, yes, you can. And I said, yes, I will. And here we are. And I'm so excited. Thank you so much. You're listening to Radio Fairfax. Fairfax, Virginia, on your TV, computer, or mobile device. And yes, we are broadcast live worldwide on www.radiofairfax.org every Saturday night at 8 o'clock. Now, don't worry. I know Saturday nights are date nights. Go have fun and check us out on YouTube. Just key in Frankly Speaking with Tyra G. Those of you who like to send me those wonderful emails, you know I love to connect offline. That's Tyra at TyraGarlington.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. And thank you, Courtney Nero, for composing and performing our theme song and so creatively naming it, I Am Listening. This September, our theme is bold and untold. Sometimes things that need to be talked about don't make it to the dinner table, to polite conversations or parties. We've been exploring some of those, and today is like none other. Uh, We also continue to discover who's seated around the table, who's walking in those spaces that is often uncomfortable to inhabit. We're going to listen to their words, and we're going to see how their lives speak. September is Suicide Prevention Month. On average, adjusted for age, the annual U.S. suicide rate increased 24% between 1999 and 2014, from 10.5 to 13 suicides per 100,000. That's the highest rate recorded in 28 years. Imagine a phenomenon so prominent, so pervasively growing that we are called to intentionally focus on how a prosperous nation such as ours lets a segment of our society give up. When I Googled suicide-related books written in 2017, I stopped at 136, and that was only on page four out of several. When a family member commits suicide, the entire family is plunged into confusion and grief. Life is instinctively valued by all of life's creatures. Think of this, even a blade of grass or a flower fights for the privilege of life. When someone close to you voluntarily ends their life, your entire value system is thrown into question. Family members may also be consumed with guilt, thinking somehow they should have seen the signs that led to the individual's suicide. I thought today an interesting way to walk into our space 
would be to share some poetry. The title of the group of poems is called Remembering Lives Lost to Suicide. The first one is My Best Friend's Departure. It begins, I jumped, you caught me. I laughed, you joked. I was down, you picked me up. I crumbled, you glued me back together. I loved you, and you loved me back. You jumped, I couldn't catch you. You forgot to laugh, I couldn't remind you. You were down, I couldn't hold you. You crumbled, I had no glue. You loved me. I still love you. Without no warning or sign, you ventured to a world divine. I refuse to say goodbye, yet tonight I cry. My tears are for you, my friend, but our legacy will not end. For I shall see you soon, but first I have some living to do. I promise I won't forget. Your face is embedded in my heart. The following poem was written by Ayo Yatunde at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention Candlelight Vigil during National Suicide Prevention Week. This one's a little long, but I think if you follow the imagery and the metaphors, it will touch your heart. It's called, We Witness Our Sorrows, We Vigil Our Lives. Dear Great Mysteries, We are here before you as humble and hopeful human beings. We're humble because we can't escape pain. We're hopeful because we still love life. We are here before each other as strangers and friends. Strangers because we cannot know each other's pain. Friends because our survival depends on our friendliness. We are here at nighttime and daylight. Nighttime to represent our sorrow, daylight elsewhere in the world to represent our joy. We are here with loss and with gain, loss of loved ones we wish we could have saved, gain because through the experience of loss, we gain wisdom. We know we're not saviors. This wisdom returns us to humility. May our humility keep us in right relationship with the great mysteries. This right relationship keeps us connected to one another's. May our connection heal our isolation. This isolation inspires us to be friends. May our friendships remind us of our interdependency. This interdependency is rife with sorrow and joy. May we be at peace with life's vicissitudes throughout this journey of living. And may our candlelight vigil illuminate our hearts, our memories, and our hopes for abundant life. May it be so. The next one is a short one by Cynthia Han. It says, there's death all around us. We don't pay attention until we do. Another short one by Jeanette Walls. When people kill themselves, they think they're ending the pain, but all they're doing is passing it on to those they leave behind. And lastly, I want you to listen to this one. On April 16th, 2015, it was written by the Semicolon Project. It says, everyone who self-harms, is depressed or suicidal, has anxiety, is unhappy, going through a broken heart, just loved, lost some loved one, draw a semicolon on your wrist. A semicolon represents a sentence the author could have ended but chose not to. The author is you and the sentence is your life. After our break, we're going to meet a woman who inhabits the space where suicide prevention is a priority. She's director of PRS Crisis Link in Fairfax County. She inhabits the space of proactivity and passion for quality of life. Put your feet up, grab a snack, but stay close. And we are back. Laura, 
welcome Laura Mayer. And I get that right, Mayer? That's correct. Wonderful. She's sitting here with a big smile and a t-shirt that says... All texts live. <laughs> That's right. She's going to tell us what that means. Now, uh, Laura, you're aware that I ask each of my guests to introduce themselves. Yep. And I do that because this is radio. And I like for people to get a feel for my guests from the way they speak and their voice. So you're on. Who are you? Well, first, congratulations on your one-year anniversary. Thank That's you. such a huge success, and that I'm so honored to be here at a time when you are experiencing such an <laughs> amazing event. Um, I know it takes a lot of work to do things like this. Um, it has so been, it's but it's wonderful. Impressive. Thank you. Um, and thank you for having me and talking about this really uh, difficult issue. Um, I am the director of PRS Crisis Link, and we are a 24-hour hotline, text line, um, predominantly. But we also do a couple other things that are really important. Um, one of them is our caring program, where we connect with isolated older adults every day. We, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's an amazing program. It's called program. the caring program? Yeah, we enroll clients who um, might have a hard time with mobility or might be a little more socially isolated. Yeah. And we do a friendly call every day to make sure that they're safe, to talk with them about what's going on in their lives, medication reminders. Um, so a lot of people who um, have maybe adult children living in other states may not right. visit them as much. We connect with them as well. Um, and the reason we do this is we see... Uh, human connection as one of the primary uh, preventers of suicide. Yes, There's, yes, yes. You know, lots of other really important things which we can talk about, but Crisis Link is really designed as a public health approach to suicide prevention, uh, looking at things across the lifespan that will impact a person from a young person to an older adult and making sure there are services and connections for them all the time, which is why we have that 24 hour center um, that we're operating. Uh, me personally, I, I kind of walk two lines professionally. I obviously have the, the career in suicide prevention. I hold a lot of you know, really amazing seats in work groups and um, positions in the community that give me a really um, interesting perspective on everything that's happening. But I also have my own personal experience with suicide, which um, is what drives my passion. So I lost my dad to suicide when I was 15. Mm. And it was a very complicated time to, um, you learn a lot at that age and yes. you learn how to think about your world at that age. And when I was 15 and he died, I had to pick a, how I thought about it. You mm -hmm. know, some people were saying he was in pain. He's in a better place right now. He's, he's, um, he's relieved of his suffering or he's a selfish person and he's going to hell. And as a 15 year old, that's a really scary thought yes. about what it means living and dying and I was in a lot of pain and so for me I had to choose which of those theories I subscribed to and I chose the I, the perspective that he was suffering and he's in a better place which is is fine and all but when you're 15 and you're in a lot of pain and you're suffering um, you start to wonder if that's not a viable option for you. Now I, I really want to put a comma there because what you've said is so significant the intergenerational question mm -hmm. because we know that uh, when you observe suicide and experience that that can also move you mm -hmm. move the dial Absolutely. on your behavior out of depression or what have you mm -hmm. but what I'm interested in you didn't walk that road alone did no. you who were your heroes your, your support system that that helped you reason mm -hmm. to move through that season you know I think the everyone likes to think that it's your family and um, it was not always my family because suicide has um, complicated after effects on families yes, and yes. everyone grieves differently so for me I had to find a group of people that could handle it um, okay. other people who uh, may be a bit older so I leaned into my faith community at the time mm -hmm. um, I joined a local youth group I, I wasn't really prior I didn't have a connection prior to my faith community um, but I found a safe space in my youth group working um, alongside my peers um, and finding some purpose outside of that but it wasn't, um, it wasn't all roses, and it wasn't all supportive. Because at the time, I mean, that was almost 20 years ago. We didn't talk about we it like we now. We didn't talk about it. Yeah. And we didn't accept it. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was a very isolating experience. Mm. And for me, I, the only option I really had to get support around it was is mental health treatment, mm -hmm. um, which was also super uninformed at the time. So it was kind of this, you know, a whole bunch of contributing factors to where I landed. 
but I, I didn't have the support that we have now in our community. I didn't know who to turn to, who to talk to about it. And it's a really big thing for kids to talk about. Of course it is, and yes. other kids don't know how to talk about it, so you can't really talk with your friends. So for me, there was a period of time where I just I lived, but I didn't know how to live in the space that I was in. I had to kind of fake it and, mm-hmm. and connect in other ways without really giving um, any voice to what was going on inside for me. But you held on. Well, that holding on path was a little rocky for me. Okay. Um, it's, I'm not the only one. There's so many amazing stories of other people who have gone through similar things. Um, and for the, about the next five to ten years of my life, I struggled. And I had my own suicide behaviors. I you know, got into a pattern of there's no way out of this. Yes, yes, I understand. And um, I found a really amazing champion. Um, who my therapist at the time, we still have a good relationship. She, she lives in another state. But um, she saw value in me that I didn't know I had. And something that we find in suicide prevention work, and now that now I do, mm-hmm. um, is other people sometimes have to live for you. And they have to find the energy for you. And they have to give you meaning and purpose and connection until you can find your own. So I was fortunate enough to have a provider that was – incredibly experienced um who went a little out of the norm to meet me where i was um and i now have this amazing life because she invested in me so that that's why i'm here doing what i'm doing because i think other people need that too i am um i too have uh walked that path and uh i'm thinking about the same period of time and for my community, we still weren't talking about it. Uh, I had brains enough to go to the company for whom I worked and get a referral. And um, as you said, the road back is one day at a time, one breath at a time. But I love what you said when you said you had others that had to live for you. Mm-hmm. They had to. They had to be you for a while, mm-hmm. and you just held on. And I hope. I can't help but believe from the people I see, and I actually worked on the clinical staff at the University of California, San Diego. Mm-hmm. The people I saw did not understand they were worthy. Right. And the biggest problem they had was separating what was happening to them mm-hmm. from the person that they were. Mm-hmm. And for me, I'm committed to empowering and encouraging and educating, just connecting. Absolutely. And when you said the whole isolation thing is, uh, that's big. It is huge. Because I think the tendency is shame. I'll go back so no one can see me. Mm-hmm. And some put on masks. The masks get too heavy. Mm-hmm. But you found a champion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I loved what you said, who invested in A whole lot. Because <laughs> I wasn't easy. But Well, you know, who it. is easy <laughs> when you get to that point, exactly. right? Exactly. Well, congratulations for that. Thank you. And I'm sure that that gets translated in what you do every day. Absolutely. I have all kinds of questions for you, but yeah. um, I was I did all this research. Of course, I did mm-hmm. <clears throat> about numbers and all that. But we'll get on that later. I want to know about Crisis Link mm-hmm. because it's so vital. Absolutely. Um, how do you staff? How do you recruit? Mm-hmm. volunteers, train them, and how do you sustain them? Because when I was in that, that role, <laughs> you know, you can burn out. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you all do? So um, the first thing that is really important for people to understand is not just that we're a crisis center, but we're a center that's ash- a- actually answering the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. So that number, 1-800-273-TALK, oh, okay. that's promoted everywhere. And if you're familiar with the Logic song that came out recently with that title, yes, that number is a national number that's being distributed to local crisis centers. There's a lot of misconception about there must be a call center in the middle of somewhere that's answering all these calls, and that's not true. Um, it's people like Crisis Link, PRS Crisis Link, that's doing that in the local community. And that's invaluable because we are you. Exactly, um, exactly. We know your community. We live and work and breathe in it, and we understand the unique stressors, and we want to keep it that way. So it's something that we were part of our campaign this, this month is to really start educating our community about not only who we are, 
but how we're funded and how it all works. So these okay, questions are great. There you go. Um, so you excited. Got the mic. <laughs> yeah. So um, we have a mixed staff of volunteers and paid staff, but majority of volunteers. And okay. these are not people who are mental health clinicians. These are not people who are social workers. These are people who just want to make a difference. Um, they're coming into our services for three to four hours a week. Um, and they're highly trained and they come from work they come from school they come from home with their kids and their purpose of being there is truly to use this experience to feel connected to their community or to give back or to learn something Uh so if you're out there and you're wondering if this is for you if you feel those things that you want to be connected you want to give back and you want to do it in a meaningful way that's not just like a one and done kind of thing that's kind of long term um, we're the place for you, and we give really great training. And I think that's what everyone's a little scared about. Yeah, I talk about that. I mean, okay, <laughs> yeah. I'm walking through the door, and I'm, or I've called. We made an appointment. And I said, you know what? My name is Tyra. Mm-hmm. I'm a survivor, and I want to help. Then we say, great, let's talk. And okay. so we have this process. We go through um, several interviews, and not just for us to learn about you, but for you to experience us. And I think that's really important that – Not every way of helping feels good to everybody. And if you're going to make an investment in an organization like PRS, you should know what it looks like and feels like. So we do a phone interview, and then we have you come in to meet with me and see our center and talk to people and and talk about the things that are driving you to this space. I like that. It's important. It's, It's an interview more for you to interview us, which is kind of different than most interviews. But we talk about things that no one talks about. We talk about how do we think about suicide, how we think about a lot of the issues in our lives right now about what it would be like to um, provide service to somebody who's maybe not so friendly to you and can yes. give you firsthand a sense of the calls that we take. Um, and then from there, we have a training program that everyone goes through. It's a standardized training. And we start with a two-day evidence-based workshop. It's called ASSIST, which stands for Applied Suicide Intervention Skills Training. And the reason that we put that up front is a couple important reasons. One Sometimes training doesn't work out for everybody, but we want you to walk away with tangible skills. We want to invest in you as a suicide prevention person, regardless of whether you continue with us. And so this evidence-based training is not something we design. It's something that we're trained to provide um, and where it's closely monitored. And so no matter what, you walk away with this certification. Mm -hmm. Once you go through that certification and you're still okay with the content, you still want to do it, Um, We have you enter into our classroom training, which is a mix between weekends and evenings, like when most people are available, and then we send you to an online component. So we do both. We try to make it, um, when you're in person, you're not just sitting and listening, you're doing. And then we augment that with online training, so you get kind of more of the details, the nitty gritty, and then you come back in and experience it again. So we've worked for the past almost 50 years on perfecting this training program, um, and we're always evolving it based on what the needs are, what the science says, what the helping um, literature says, so that we can change it whenever we need to Mm. and that it's easily delivered in your time. Now, one thing I'm thinking about is um, it's a standardized structured Mm -hmm. program absolutely so when you make a change does that impact the outcome of the crisis link volunteers what it obviously elevates their skill level Mm -hmm. absolutely and so it's adapting to something that caused it to change Mm -hmm. what could that be give me an example so um you know several years ago we realized that teen dating violence was an issue that was you know popping up in lots of different places and we had to make sure that our crisis workers were able to identify it because it's something that's not very easy when a kid's just talking about it. You have to know the signs and the symptoms and then how to respond to it in a trauma-informed way by also understanding that it's a minor child. So how do you balance that, you know, need to involve helping or trusted adults in a risky situation but also identify it? So we will add things like that throughout the training um, that may have not been needed 15, 20 years ago or not been known sure 15, 20 years now, ago. Yes. It's so important now. And our newest training has been around opioids and how do we yes. address that because opioids and suicide are so closely related. So how do we get people connected versus just sending them a referral to a place that we know nothing about? We've had to get our hands dirty and find out who's providing what and how do we get people connected and make sure our entire volunteer population and staff know how to do that the right way okay so um in two minutes yeah uh role play with me how i'm a teen Mm -hmm. i've called Mm -hmm. i've been abused Mm -hmm. i've been bullied 
date rape maybe even. Mm -hmm. I don't know what else to do. Mm -hmm. I'm like, the only thing, I'm calling you, I don't even know why I'm calling you, but mm -hmm. you hear the anxiety, mm -hmm. you hear the fear, and you hear the desperation. Mm -hmm. Now, you're a well-trained volunteer at Crisis Link. How might you address me? Well, I might say something like, it sounds incredibly overwhelming and scary, and you don't know what your next steps are, but you picked up the phone today. When you picked up, what did you need to tell me? What did you need to share with me that you couldn't share with anybody else? Perfect. And we just start there. And, and that particular question, the last one, why did you need me? versus mm -hmm. mom, dad, best friend, mm -hmm. boyfriend, et cetera. Absolutely. And you've established yourself as a helping point. Absolutely. And if they're that desperate, more than likely they're going to give you something, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I like that. I like that a lot. I'll be asking you to do that too <laughs> now. Okay. All right, so um, I like the idea. The assist training is structured. Mm -hmm. It's in person. It's online. It's testing. Mm -hmm. And then, do you observe your volunteers on the we phone? We do. Or? So once you pass through all that classroom training, certification stuff, um, you actually come in and work individually with a trainer by okay. yourself. So what we do is for six to nine hours, we supervise the line time. So we put somebody on the line because, you know, there's really, we role play a lot in training, but there's really nothing like talking to a person who's really feeling it. That's true. Um, and the, we find that the more we spend trying to practice, the more anxious people get. So we find it's just better to get them in the seat, realize they're good. They're here for great reasons. They're highly trained. They're ready to do it. And we listen to both sides of the call. And yes. we're able to chat back and forth with a person to prompt them if they get stuck, to make sure they don't lose their confidence. Yes. And walk them through several of those interactions. Um, we do that for about six hours at, uh, on the minimum. And sometimes mm. it goes up to nine. Mm -hmm. So it's that individualized training where they debrief every call, they learn new skills, and somebody's helping them along the way. And believe it or not, I've been through that. IBM actually had call centers. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Yes. No, it wasn't. It oh, wasn't. no. <laughs> Not we a had experience. a great big plastic balloon we could go punch. Oh, my you know, goodness. After someone had cussed us out. But they, the training module was very similar in that you had someone listening to both sides mm -hmm. of the conversation, right. and you were doing conflict resolution. Right. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but this is this is a, a whole different level. Very different, yeah. Level, yeah. yes. Well, okay, so how many volunteers might you have in a day at the center? Uh, it depends on the day. Um, sometimes we have six to eight people coming through at a time. Sometimes it's just two or three. Um, but right now, we're, we're not getting enough people, <laughs> and that's one of our biggest challenges is okay, that listen up. we don't have enough. Um, in case you're interested, I'm not allowed to do a call to action. But <laughs> if you're interested in making the world a better place for just one person, absolutely, you may want to give a call. Well, I think what's really interesting about Crisis Link is there's a place for everybody. There's a lot of different skill sets. There's multiple programs. We have a space. Um, if you just want to talk to isolated seniors and do friendly calls, you can do that. If you want to do text line and not have to do phone calls, you can do that. T uh, talk to I'm, I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm interrupting. Comma. No. <laughs> but uh, when I first heard about, and by the way, Crisis Link actually trained my staff uh, w when I was at Fairfax County. Awesome. And my staff were the first contact at the courthouse, government mm -hmm. center, et cetera. And we had some issues, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. both on phone and in person. And they also, we also went through mental health first aid. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that a little bit. But, um, okay, so you may have three, you may have six. What's determining how you staff on what days? How do you, you just wake up and say, you know, today's going to be like a heavy day. A lot of no. people... <laughs> There's a lot of data um, that we use to, to strategically staff. And so our volunteers, they sign up for a shift per week, um, okay. and that stays the same every week. We don't move that around unless they request it to be moved around. So it can fit into your normal schedule, Okay, and it can change you know, based on your school's or work schedule if needed. Um, and then we supplement with paid staff in other places. Gotcha. So we beef up where we need to and reduce where we can. But the reality is... Um, the number of calls coming in that we've never had this before. It's record numbers. It's something that you can't even project because it's so different. Um, and so what we did four years ago was working, but that model is not enough. And so we're actively recruiting as many people as possible um, who, who can do this work and want to be involved because 
suicide is everybody's problem. You know, it's not just mental health. It's not just public health. It's everyone's problem. And it does not discriminate. And I think that's important. And we all have to find a way to participate, which is why we're doing our our campaign. But volunteering is one of them. And, And maybe that's too much for some, but I encourage you, we do have information sessions coming up. Now, that's good. I want to I want to make sure that we repeat that at the end of the show. Yeah, so we do have information sessions. There's several of them. It's, it's a lot to remember, so it's easier just to go to our website, but we want you to come in and see. Try it out. Talk to us. See what it looks like. Ask your questions and engage us. We are more than willing to go through the, that process to make sure it's a good fit for you, um, because it might not be, but in more more cases you know this is a life-changing experience for so many uh, that they do this work they it changes them I would think that the volunteer would get a major return on the investment and maybe some help oh absolutely it's when I got into this work I found that this was more helpful to me than it was most of the people I was working with I learned so much about myself and who I wanted to be and uh, how I wanted to be involved in my community versus letting it just happen around me. I learned so much from our clients. Um, they've taught me countless lessons about how to treat one another and mm. how to love one another differently and how to be patient and um, and the empathy that we all need right now in such a divisive time. We, we need to um, learn how to listen before we talk a bit more, and, and this is a really great place to pla- practice that. Absolutely. Uh, Patience. Listen. You said before that, before those two, there was one other. Empathy. Empathy. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think one of the hardest things we have to do is learn how to treat ourselves like someone we love. And sometimes this process can help us Mm -hmm. do what we need to do. So um, let's just pretend. What time do you open? For 24 hours. Oh, that's right. 24. Yeah. Okay, your day. Let's take a day in your life. In my life. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> my life. Uh, I come in at 9. Okay. <laughs> not 24 hours for you? No, not for me, no. <laughs> okay, so what's your day like? My day... Well, first of all, make us visualize Crisis Link. You walk in. What do I see? Uh, we have about eight um, cubicles in one side of the room and then two on the other. We have supervisor offices in the same space. Okay. It's very bright. We have lots of windows now. Um, and uh, we have a lot of fun stuff in our space. So we have a whiteboard where people ask questions of each other and have little surveys and we share good news with each other. Mm. Um, we have sombreros that people wear <laughs> when they're celebrating their completion of their hours. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's a, despite the subject matter, a very happy place, Mm -hmm. snacks, tea, coffee, that kind of thing. Um, so when I walk in, I'm usually seeing what everyone's up to because Mm -hmm. uh, it's busy in the mornings. Um, they've been going strong with carrying calls and everyone calls first thing in the morning before they're on their way to work. That now, now let's think about that. Mm -hmm. People who have issues are calling you Mm -hmm. on their way to work. Yep. That, I, that needs to sit for a moment, okay? Because what that's telling us is you can't see suicide written on someone. No. If you're close to them, you may see some tendencies like isolation, mm-hmm. depre- eating, too, you know, changes in habits. Mm-hmm. But if I'm going to work and I'm going showtime mm-hmm. and inside I am dying mm-hmm. and it takes a lot of courage to admit, I am dying here, I need mm-hmm. help, and I call Christ and then I go to work. Mm-hmm. A lot of people call um, before they go in on their lunch hour right after. Mm. They, they don't have an option not to go to work. It's not a visible wound that they can take That's time That's what I'm for. talking about, right. They have to hide it. They have to push it all down, and they're usually calling us to give them that energy to make it through another couple of hours. Yes. Um, they need to normalize their experience before they have to go and fake it and pretend to be something else. So mm-hmm. that's our early morning work is just getting people ready for the day it's finding supports letting them know that they can make it through today and if they need to call back we're there for them at the end of the day it's it's not a one or done situation Mm -hmm. Um, or we're finding places for them to get resources that day that's what I also want to get to because I know you said you're out in the community Mm -hmm. and I'm sure much of your staff is as well but I'm assuming you've got some really tight partnerships and collaborations absolutely with the mental health community Mm -hmm. with the health community, Absolutely. medical community. So you've got places that know when you call, it's a referral that's mm-hmm. probably needed. Yeah. 
uh, how do you establish those relationships? How do you, what do you do? So, you know, we're a nonprofit, but we're also provided funds from our local government. So Fairfax okay. County is a big supporter and a huge champion of our work. Um, so we don't just get support from their mental health community in Fairfax. We also work closely with communications, with the health department, yes, with yes. other nonprofits who are also contracted, like Northern Virginia Family Services. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many to name. But um, one of the things that we have really valued, especially in Fairfax, is there's a lot of cross-training happening, a lot of give and take. You know, we've worked closely with the domestic violence folks, yes, um, offering yes. them training. They offer us training. We work with the courts. I still mm -hmm. do trainings at district court um, about how to talk to somebody who might be in crisis. Um, so it's a give and take. Everyone needs a little something. We need the education ourselves about what's happening to people in this, right. the systems that are impacting them. Mm -hmm. We need to understand them. So and a lot of it starts there. And we have great partners in CSB Communications yes. here. Lucy Caldwell, call well, out she's to awesome. you. She called. Um, <laughs> Did you hear that, Lucy? <laughs> she's amazing. She says to me, Tyra, she was here. <laughs> she says, Tyra, you really need to talk to Laura. I said, okay. <laughs> and then she said, and you really need to, and you really need, and I said, okay, I got it. I got it. We'll do a whole month. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we develop those kinds of relationships so that when there's opportunities, we're saying, hey, did you talk to this person? Yes. Hey, did you talk to that person? And really making sure the safety net isn't just a financial safety net, you know, where we have these relationships, but they're actually physically happening, where we're, mm -hmm. we're talking about one another and making sure that everyone knows who's doing what. Um, so that's like, you know, the first layer of it. And then we work with amazing organizations like the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, the American Association of Suicidology, and we, we show up. And that's the biggest thing in community prevention is you show up to events, you show up to meetings, and you have these conversations, and you, you have to be relentless. Um, because suicide prevention is not the only thing going on in the world. There's a lot of things happening to people, and um, there's only so many resources. It, it, right. So right. it takes champions to show up and make things happen, and that's what I'm most proud of in um, the work that we're doing in Fairfax and mm -hmm. Arlington. Mm -hmm. um, is making sure that we're creating opportunities to have relationships and to meet each other and um, and explore our partnerships. And when you talk about your partnerships, there's a lot of cause and effect mm -hmm. when you talk about the courts. Absolutely. You know, I can see you talking to a probation officer who says, I'm seeing this, what do you think? Mm -hmm. You know, those kinds of conversations going on mm -hmm. to prevent. Mm -hmm. And um, suicide prevention to me is more like an umbrella. Absolutely. That are, an octopus that has tentacles mm -hmm. going everywhere. And uh, one of the things that surprised me when I was reading was uh, very much like your story. People who observe suicide then may think their only option is, mm -hmm. and someone like your champion that interrupted that, that conversation mm -hmm. in your head Absolutely. is that, no, wait, you know. What's, what's been, uh, say, in the past month, the greatest blessing, the greatest uh, accomplishment of heart that you've had doing what you do? Only one. <laughs> um, okay, as many as you want. <laughs> as many as you want. I think there's a perception that working in suicide prevention is always a really sad thing, but no. it's such a beautiful thing, too, because I think for every one person that does die by suicide, we know that over 250 people live through those thoughts of suicide. Say that again, that's over big. Over 250 people live through their thoughts of suicide for every one suicide death. So there's so much hope out there. Um, there are people like me who have lived through them, those thoughts, lived through their experiences, and are doing amazing things. So I have been so fortunate to um, be partnering with some of these folks and doing this work and sharing our stories to say it, it doesn't always end with a period. <laughs> you know, yes, it's not all. Yes. There's not always this tragic end to it. There are, and we have to work towards that. But we also have to give voice to the people who lived because they're the ones who are going to teach us how to prevent it. Um, yes, yes. And when when you just said that, um, give voice to the people who lived. To surviving family members, mm -hmm. do you get involved with them? We have. Um, we do immediate outreach to survivors okay. of suicide. Um, we might sh we might be called out to a home to work with the family. We do have local outreach to suicide survivors. It's a loss team. It's usually me and a, another person, or I might go with mobile crisis if necessary. Okay. So we do that. Um, but uh, in the winter, or I, no, I guess it's more like January, we're hoping to offer a survivor group 
um, for people. Great. Um, we do that periodically. It's been on hiatus, um, but we feel like we need to start it up again and give people a space to do that. Survivor groups. Mm -hmm. There's not enough of them, and it's a hard thing to do. But uh, well, it's a hard thing so to admit. Come to on, do it. You know, we don't walk right. around and say, "Hey," and that's not right in your bragging book. Well, and I think this is a really important topic because um, back in June, when Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain yes. died by suicide, the CDC also released a report that same week, which kind of got overshadowed by the losses mm -hmm. about suicide, and it, it taught us a lot, or told us a lot about what we now know about suicide, and that more than half the people that die by suicide did not have a mental illness at the time of their death. and More than half. More than half. So when we think about families mm -hmm. who are experiencing a suicide loss, there are plenty of families who know that their, their loved one had a mental health issue mm -hmm. and, and not to take away from that at all. But for the families who were blindsided, by you know something that was a trauma, a temporary problem that turned into a catastrophic loss, there's the stigma of mental health that comes along with that loss that they're left to explain, which is not, not fair. Right. And why it makes it so hard to talk about suicide because there's this assumption that something was wrong with the person or something was wrong within the, the family. The shame, the guilt, the, yeah, the labels. And it's pervasive and it because it, it's, it's centered around mental health because we have so much work to do around stigma and mental health. Um, but this is another layer of it, a unique thing. Um, and then this belief that comes with it that this was a choice that the person made. And that is something we don't understand um, as researchers, as clinicians, as public health experts. We don't know because it's really hard study. And there's not a lot of research dollars being allocated for suicide. And so the message that we're trying to get out there is, if we start thinking about suicide as a pain response versus a conscious choice, I like that. We might be able to have some more empathy for folks we just don't understand why it happened. So I like to think of it as like a hot stove. Okay. When if you touch a hot stove, you instinctually pull your hand off to stop the pain, right? Right. If everyone does that. You don't have a conscious choice of, ow, that hurts. Let me remove my hand. Mm -hmm. What if your life is the hot stove? and yeah. you're touching it, you instinctively pull your hand back to make it stop. It's not always a conscious thought. It's a, how do I make this stop now? Yes. And that's a group of suicide that we really need to understand better because this is happening after a loss. And we call it the umbrella of loss for a reason because it's loss of identity, loss of income, loss of relationship, loss of purpose. There's so many things that contribute to that um, indescribable pain where living feels worse than dying um, and it can happen so quickly yes. so it's something that families struggle with because they're looking for the mental health symptoms right and they're focused on that and right. what was wrong with the person versus what was happening what happened to them that led to that pain and see that's that's part of and I, I didn't reason it as loquaciously as you did just <laughs> then but my whole my whole mandate is to help people understand mm -hmm. that what happens to them mm -hmm. is not who they are right and the loss of identity loss of job someone thinking oh I'm all that and I'm bag of chips I failed <laughs> and then boom it's gone I'm a failure right. and with failure with the shame piece you become what it is so you can't there's there's no recovery mm -hmm. with guilt you can use to motivate mm -hmm. but if I say I did something bad therefore I'm bad Mm -hmm. That's hard to work out of mm -hmm. by yourself. And I hear you saying, I love the uh, pain response analogy. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to start using that because it takes, uh, to me, it takes stigma away from mm -hmm. the discussion. Absolutely. And all of us understand pain. Mm -hmm. So we need, to, we need to talk to some people about, <laughs> you know, some professional people <laughs> about changing how they talk about it. Yeah, there's a lot of confusion about what suicide is because we have one word to describe a whole lot of things. Yes, and yes. And that's part of the issue here is that we use suicide to describe um, the same thing that happens in a young person who um, you know, is going through a life crisis that's so unbearable they resort to that pain response versus other people who have long lives of suffering that they're trying to make stop. And, and we, but it's the same word, and it's so much more complicated than one word. But yes. that's where we're at right now is we're yes. grappling with how do we describe these experiences universally 
But that's simplifying a very complicated problem. And as I'm listening to you, I'm wondering if we're not doing that on purpose. I'm wondering if putting suicide in one bucket helps us not pay attention as much attention. Right. It's so much easier if we can compartmentalize it. Yes, yes. Oh my goodness. Oh, we have so much to do. <laughs> so I, you know what I do I do need to take just a, a little break. Sure. Okay. You stay stay close. And we are back. I'm just, I, I have been taking notes, key words that Laura has shared. And actually, I've expanded my awareness and uh, feel very motivated to find a way to uh, participate and support uh, suicide prevention and uh, crisis link. I'm excited. Uh, we're sitting here with uh, Laura Mayer. Uh, director of PRS Crisis Link, and she has really been depositing some nuances about suicide prevention that at least I hadn't thought of. Maybe you out there have. But I want to ask you one thing before I ask you to read your letter. Mm -hmm. What um, What's the greatest either group of lessons you've learned or the greatest lesson you've learned doing your work? Now, I know you're immersed in the community. Mm -hmm. I know Crisis Link is dependent on and uh, many partnerships and mm -hmm. collaborations. I know that you have a huge volunteer, not enough, mm -hmm. want some more volunteers, uh, that you train them well. It's hybrid training, mm -hmm. interviews, classroom, online, and uh, monitored. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that the volunteers seem to get as much out of it as they put into it mm -hmm. so um here you are now you're the director looking across the room thinking about what's the greatest lesson you've learned say in the last month oh, that's a tough question i um, know but it's such a good one um I, you know, I always come back to there's a quote that's something like, um, be kind because everyone's fighting a battle of some kind. Mm -hmm. And when you're in the helping profession, you often only assign that to the people you're helping. You don't assign it to the people you work with or the people out there. You know, you... you Them kinda, and us, yes. There's all of that going on. And, and for me, it's really been... Life has been putting me in my place a little bit to remind me that... Um, Everything has to start with kindness and an understanding because nothing is accomplished without those two things. And uh, it's not only reserved for those who reach out to us, but everyone in our community deserves that kind of uh, perspective when we enter in any conversation. So and it's a I big think, one for me. <laughs> well, it's a big one. It should be a big one for each of us. And I think it may be, be, be a way to crawl out of the hole mm -hmm. that uh, we may have found ourselves in by not loving. Mm -hmm. Uh, each other and ourselves. Absolutely. Um, yes, I have asked Laura, as I do with each of my guests, to write a letter to her younger self, and I'm going to ask her to read it now. Uh, dear Laura, you are already stronger than you know. Your journey is just beginning, and there are so many times you will ask yourself, why me? You'll learn that this question will never be answered mm -hmm. and that despite all of it, you'll make it through and you'll come out on the other side. You will understand for yourself one day that the phrase of everything happens for a reason isn't always fair and that you'll learn that perhaps everything does not happen for a reason, but your journey is about making meaning and defining your own path. You'll learn that as a little person, your voice didn't have much power, but as an adult, your words will hold incredible weight. You will use your words unwisely because you never knew that you had such power. Mistakes are okay, missteps are okay, and your stumbles will create new paths, new lessons, and new energy. You will gain insight into how your journey will inspire others, which at the moment may be pretty hard to believe. You're brave, you're unique, and you are immensely strong. The hardest lesson you'll have to overcome is learning that people are just people. Even the really amazing, trustworthy, intelligent, inspiring people, they're just people. <laughs> everyone um, doesn't always have everything you think they have, and everyone else seems to have more than you do, but you have it too. You can be whatever it is you want to be. You're not lacking. You're not deficient. You're you. Kind of stuck with you. <laughs> so it might be a really good idea to stop fighting you. Let people help you. Let people know you. The risk is worth it every single time. 
and you'll eventually find your tribe and they're going to value you like nothing you ever thought possible. Your future is so big, even though you feel the smartest you've ever been, the oldest you've ever been, and the strongest you'll ever be. But I can tell you now that you have so much growing to do and the future is very big. All the work you're doing right now is building the amazing woman you will be, and it's not all for nothing, I can assure you. Be proud and hold your little blonde head up. It's going to be all right. I can say, dear Laura, it's more than all right. <laughs> you are such a treasure. And on behalf of those that you supervise and those that rely on your services, I want to say thank you so much. Happy to do it. I want to add a little something, something to what she said. Okay. It's called what's meant to be will eventually be. True strength comes when you have so much to cry and complain about, but you prefer to smile and appreciate your life instead. There are blessings hidden in every struggle you face, but you have to be willing to open your heart and your mind to see them. In the end, loving your life is about trusting your intuition, taking chances, losing and finding happiness, cherishing the memories, and learning through experience. It's a long-term journey. You might not even end up exactly where you intended to be, but you will eventually arrive precisely where you need to be. If you're waking up in the morning or at lunchtime or in the evening, you're thinking, oh, really? Think about this. When you're in doubt, check your label. You are not a markdown. You are a designer's original. God has set your value. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Laura talked about a tribe. Surround yourself with people who can remind you of who you were created to be. And most importantly, understand with every fiber in your body that you are not alone. You are worthy. You have everything you need inside of you to be the person you were created to be. I know this. I want you to know it. I am here and I hear you. Your seat at the table is guaranteed. All you have to do is show up. My guest today again is Laura Meyer, Director of PRS Crisis Link in Arlington. You're listening to Radio Fairfax in Fairfax, Virginia. This is Tyra G. Until next time, bye.